As, as always, I, I want to just reference, I haven't read the whole text in a little bit. I've been always referencing it in some way, but I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. If you'll indulge me just for a moment to, to remind us of how we are to approach God's holy word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul writes these things. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. And then he says how we are to approach his word, as we to understand his word. He says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, he goes on to write, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what? What are they, friends? They're foolishness to him. Nor can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. Oh, that the Lord will pour out his spirit into our hearts so we might have an understanding of what he has for us today. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment of silent prayer to just invite the Lord to speak to your heart and to mine? Because if he touches us, our lives will not be the same. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have heard and are hearing the prayers ascending before you once again, asking for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Lord, we want to have Jesus' words in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, forgive us for where we've fallen short, Lord. We pray that your grace would be sufficient and we thank you that it is, Lord, because you shed your, your, your blood for our sins on, on Calvary. Lord, I, I ask that, that you would pour out your spirit that we might have the eyes to see and ears to hear. As we sang in, the, in our uh, kind of introit song, open our eyes, Lord, that we might see Jesus. Open our ears, Lord, that we might hear what he has to say. And so, Father, we plead for that, Lord. I plead, Father, that you would take me just a humble vessel, that you would hide me behind your cross, that you might be lifted up, that you might be glorified, Challenge us, shake us up, and then send us forth, Lord, empowered, Lord, to go out and walk with you and to, to share your love and grace to the world around us. This is my prayer in the precious name of Jesus. We love you so much. Please come soon. Amen. Today's sermon, hang on to the plow. Hang on to the plow. Something that's dear to my heart. I want to start by sharing a story of a friend of mine that I met back in the 80s. He was a, su a successful guide up in Alaska. He would guide hunting trips, horseback hunting trips. I don't know if some of you might find that kind of exciting. He would take these horses and they would ride horses and they'd pack all this stuff and they would haul it up in the mountains and these guys would pay big bucks to go out hunting with him. And the best time for, for hunting, of course, was, was over the weekend. I mean, the weekend was everything. That's when people were available the most. And so, you know, the, the weekend was very, very important. Well, in the 80s, early 80s, he gets invited to a Daniel and Revelation seminar. And he decides he's going to go to this Daniel and Revelation seminar. And as he goes to this Daniel and Revelation seminar, he begins to learn things in the Bible that he'd never heard before. And he says, wow, that's incredible stuff. Wow, Jesus is, is in the sanctuary in heaven. Wow. And then he learns about the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now, if, if you were like I was, raised in, in, this, in this particular denomination, you know, it's just something that you're used to, you grew up with, but if you weren't, it's, it's a cross 
that you have to, do. if you are convicted on the seventh day Sabbath, it's a cross that you have to bear. Are you going to change the way you live your life to follow his commandments? And so he begins to wrestle with this as he's going through this Daniel and Revelation seminar. And he decides that he is going to take his stand for the seventh day Sabbath and for Jesus. And he accepts this message. Well, wouldn't you know it, he now is going to guide the next summer. He's been keeping Sabbath. And guess what all his guide buddies are telling him? You're crazy. The most important day is Saturday when it comes to guiding. You're going to go broke. Nothing's going to work for you. And so he begins to wrestle. Am I going to keep it or not? Am I going to keep my business or am I going to keep my faith? I'm going to keep my business or my faith? My business or my faith? He decides I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to keep my faith. And he says, you know what? I'm guiding, but, but, I'm, but I'm not guiding on Sabbath. Now, let me ask you a question before I tell you the rest of the story. Is God able to bless you abundantly beyond what you think is possible? He is. He had his best financial year ever guiding at that point. His best summer he'd ever had. He ended up deciding after that to, to go out of guiding. He went into the plumbing business and had a very successful plumbing business. But he decided he was going to stand for his faith, that he was going to hang on despite his circumstances. He was going to bear his cross. Must Jesus bear this cross alone? No, friends, there's a cross for you and me. Every single one of us has a cross to bear. Every single one of us has choices to make. My friend said, I'm going to stand for what I believe is the truth. And guess what? The Lord blessed him. Are you going to stand for what you believe is the truth? What the Word of God says? For the Word of God is the truth. Sanctify them by your truth, the Bible says, for your word, these are the words of Jesus, is truth. And so he, makes his, he made his stand and the Lord blessed him. I want to consider a couple things in today's sermon. Number one, have you, cons- have you counted the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you counted the cost? Sometimes it's easy, but, but friends, sometimes is it hard? Can anyone testify that sometimes being a disciple of Jesus can be difficult? Anybody else testify with me? Have you counted the costs? And in those testing times, here's, here's the, next, the next question. Will you hang on to the, quotes plow in those testing times? Or you give it up? Will you hang on to the plow? I believe every single one of us must consider these things. Are we hanging on to this plow right now? Let's go back to our scripture. Let's read Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57 once again. Our scripture for the day, Luke 9, verse beginning in verse 57. Jesus says some fascinating things in this passage. Verse 57. Now it happened as they, that is Jesus and his disciples, journeyed on the road that somebody said to him, Lord, I will follow you, what does he say? Wherever you go. Now let me ask you a a question, friends. If if your heart is inclined to win souls for the kingdom of heaven, if somebody says, I'm going to follow Jesus wherever he goes, what's your reaction? Well, I'll tell you what mine is. I'm ecstatic. That's what I want. I want people to know Jesus to follow him wherever he goes. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus, friends. Follow his word. I'm a fallible human being. You're a fallible human being. Let's hang on to Jesus. He says, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says something fascinating to him. He says, foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. And then he says, but the Son of Man, imagine this, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The Son of Man has where to lay his head. He doesn't say the Ritz-Carlton, does he? 
He says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The man claims, has a claim for full commitment. This is good. He's talking the talk, but is he really, is he really willing to walk the walk? Jesus says, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are you still in? Are you still in? Are you still willing to follow Jesus wherever he goes? There's going to be hard trials, hard experiences. Are you going to follow him? He goes on to say, verse 59, Luke 9, verse 59, Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Seems like a reasonable request. And then Jesus says, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. I have to pause there for a moment and ask the question, is Jesus being uncompassionate is he being harsh what do you think friends that's a it's a fascinating statement of course jesus isn't being uncompassionate i mean this is this is the one that has promised that he's going to wipe away every tears from our, every tear from our eyes he's the one that tells us to love our enemies he's the one that breaks the cultural norms of the day to go out and show the love of jesus to the world He touches the lepers. He speaks to the Samaritans. He gives the gospel to those that were hated by the Jews. He gives the gospel to the tax collector, the sinner. Does Jesus have compassion for the sinner? Oh, friends, yes. Remember remember his compassion even in in the times of, of death. Remember the story of the widow of Nain? The widow of Nain. Her only son has died. A young man, and he's there being buried, you know, carried to, to where they were going to lay him to rest. And Jesus, again, goes up, breaks all the norms of the day, and he touches the coffin, the casket, if you will. And the Bible says that they stood still. And there's this great weeping, and here this, this master is coming, this great teacher is coming, and all this rejoicing with him, and this... The, the, the contrast can't be more stark. And Jesus raises the young man to life. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I bet the joy would have been unspeakable. <laughs> what, what was a, a morning party turns into the greatest joy, joyful rejoicing you could ever imagine. Did Jesus have compassion for the dead and the grieving families? Oh, friends, yes, he did. Remember the story of Lazarus? Jesus there at the tomb, and he feels the pain of those that are waiting and mourning over the loss of Lazarus. And he says in John eleven thirty five 35, that Jesus wept. It doesn't say he cried a little bit of tears or his eyes got watery. No, it says he wept. Does Jesus have compassion? Oh, he has compassion. He also has life in him, and he raises the dead. The transformation of the gospel. I, I want to suggest to you, friends, that what Christ is saying is not to be uncompassionate, but he's saying, he says, he says, mission first. Mission first. Your first calling is to go and spread the eternal gospel. The everlasting gospel. To give hope to the dying. To give hope to those that don't know that there's hope in Jesus. Turn with me for a moment. Keep your finger there in Luke chapter 9, but turn with me just a couple chapters later over to Luke chapter 14. Are you really all in? You see, friends, following Jesus has to even take priority over our family relations. This is, so, this is such a challenge. But following Jesus must come first. Notice Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Jesus writes, or Jesus says, excuse me, as as Luke writes it down. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, 
If anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his what? What does your Bible say? His cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is not saying that we must hate our loved ones in the way that we use hate. What is he saying? He's saying these things must have a second priority to following God in his law and his love for your life. Christ must come first. God must come first in your life. I love my brother. I love my, my uh, parents. I love my grandparents. But Jesus must come first. Let me ask you, friends, are you still all in for Jesus? Have you counted the cost? The investment, I, I would suggest, is 100%, but the returns are infinite. Returns are infinite. He goes on to say in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Have you ever heard a skeptic mocking someone that claims to be a Christian because... They're not all in for Jesus. I've seen it. They say, this is what you say, but this is how you live. Are you truly all in? Verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else will send will the, while the other is still a great way off. He sends a delegation and asks for conditions of peace. And then he says, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. The cost for following Jesus is, is, is literally being all in for him. If it sounds heavy, friends, it's because it is. Turn with me back to Luke chapter 9, verse 61. Luke chapter 9, verse 61. Another, the third one now, another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Thus the name of the sermon. Hang on, friends, to the plow. Which direction are we going in life? Which direction are we going to go in our Christian walk? There's no looking back. Hang on to that plow. It is heavy. It's, it's life or death. The question is, is why are we emphasizing this? And this has been a burden on my heart, friends. This is, this is why I think this is such an important topic to think about, though it is heavy. I see the devil constantly trying to snatch that Christian walk away from people. Have you seen it? He doesn't care how he does it. He doesn't care if he gets you angry. He doesn't care if he discourages you. He doesn't care if he distracts you. He just wants to snatch it away. How many of you have seen it? We've all seen it. My heart aches when I see someone fall away. My friend out of college begins a successful business. Well, praise the Lord. There's nothing wrong with having a successful business. But the business then takes priority over Jesus. And, and as the years go by, all of a sudden, he finds himself just walked away from the Lord. And what does it do to our hearts? It breaks our hearts. Some of us ourselves have been there. Maybe some of us, God forbid, are even on this path. Well, how does this even happen? Staying in our Luke theme here, let's go back to Luke chapter 8. 
How does this happen? Luke chapter 8. Jesus tells a wonderful, wonderful parable. Check this out. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. Luke chapter 8 and verse 4. Now notice this, friends. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. The parable begins, verse 5, Luke 8, verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the what? What does it fall on? The wayside. And it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Hallelujah for verse 8. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That is, those that have spiritual ears, open our ears, Lord, that we might understand what he has to say. The disciples don't quite get it. Verse 11, they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, explain this parable. He says, what, do you not understand? And he begins to explain in verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is what? What is this seed that the sower has sown? The word of God. So God's word goes and is sown. It's scattered abroad. The Lord promises that if that his word will not return unto him, void. The word goes forth. A Christian comes and shares the word of God. And then Jesus says, those by the wayside, now listen to this, are the ones who hear, and when the devil comes, and takes away the word out of their heart, lest they should what? Believe and be saved. Take it away before it can even germinate. Snatches it away. Verse 13, But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and they have no root who believe for a while in the time of temptation, and in the time of temptation they fall away. So they're believing, they're rejoicing in Jesus, and then all of a sudden temptations begin to bombard them. And they fall away. They give it up for these things out here. Verse 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. If there is ever a, a section that describes the majority of, our, of, of the Christian church today, it would be this one. We get so distracted by the things of the world. And so, as as. The Lord tells us in Revelation chapter 3, he says, we're lukewarm. We're, we're a little bit in and we're a little bit out. The things of the world, we don't want to let go of those because, well, they keep us comfortable. And the thorns choke us out. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word, with a noble and good heart. Keep it and bear fruit with patience. Let me ask you, friends, which soil describes your experience? It's not for me to judge. It's between you and the Lord. Which soil are you in? Be planted, friends. I beg you, be planted in good soil. Be planted in the word of God through his Holy Spirit, the representative of Christ on earth today. Stay grounded there. Don't let anything turn you aside from studying his word. Don't let anything turn you aside from spending that time in prayer with him. King David writes, evening and morning and at noon, I cry aloud to you. 
dedicated his life three times a day. How many times a day did, did Daniel dedicate his life to the Lord? Three times a day, evening, morning, and noon. And what did the Apostle Paul says? He says, pray without ceasing. Hang on, be planted in the good soil. There's a, there's a second application, and I love the second application to this. What kind of soil are you scattering the gospel seed in? Are you scattering the gospel seed in good soil? It's a powerful question to ask. If the soil is bad, friends, if you're scattering the gospel seed but the soil is bad, amend the soil. Weed the soil. If I have a, I like to garden. If I don't have nutrients in my soil, guess what I can do to the soil? I can put compost in the soil. I can put rock dust. I can do all these different things out there, right? I can put all sorts of stuff in there, and my bad soil becomes good soil. If my plant germinated in the wrong spot, guess what I can do? I can dig it up and transplant it. Do you see the application, friends? Our job is beyond just scattering seed. Are we actually trying to prepare the soil of people's hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us? If the soil is bad, fix the soil. How do we amend it? We amend it with much prayer. Are you, are you praying in behalf of others? Do you intercede for others? It is God's will that we do this, I believe. And he will amend this soil in answer to prayer. Oh, friends, I believe in prayer. I've seen too many answers to prayer. Have you been praying for your wayward son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter for 20, 30 years and it seems like nothing's changing? Are you going to stop? Lord, have mercy. Keep praying. Keep praying till they come into the kingdom of heaven. Be like Jabez. Lord, increase my territory. God's kingdom is worth it. There's no sacrifice that's not worth it. Amend the soil. My brothers and sisters, this is my heart cry today. Don't fall away now. Don't turn back now. Hang on to that plow a little longer. As it says in Revelation, be faithful even unto death. The fact of the matter is, friends, it's not going to get easier. It's going to get more difficult before Jesus comes again. The Bible tells us that. Don't give up. My brothers and sisters, this was on my heart really heavy yesterday. Don't let your discouraged, distracted, disobeying, even deceived brother and sister fall away without a fight. Look around. You are your brothers and sisters' keepers. Remember that, that question that Cain asked? Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is, with a res is a resounding, yes, you are. What if we look at every single person that is around us as a potential son and daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Does that affect the way we treat them? Does that affect what we're willing to, to take on? Does it affect my interactions with with the neighbor that is driving me crazy. I mean, these are potential sons and daughters of the king, and maybe you are the one to make the difference in their life. That Jesus can use you to win them. Help them not turn back. Help them not compromise their faith. Encourage for them. Pray for them. Pray with them. Study with them. Serve with them. Help them be faithful even unto death. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is a fascinating chapter of the Bible. Jesus goes through and 
John chapter 6 and begins to say, I'm the bread of life. I'm the manna that came down from heaven. And he says statements like this in John chapter 6. Those that don't eat my flesh and drink my blood have no part with me. And people are like, ew. They're like, I don't want a part of that. That's a hard saying. Now what is Jesus saying? Jesus doesn't leave us to wonder. He sees disciples that have been walking with him up to this point beginning to turn away to the right and to the left. They say, that, this is a hard saying. Notice verse 60, John chapter 6 and verse 60. The word of God says that, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? And then he says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? And then he says this, he says, it is the spirit who gives life and the flesh profits how much? Nothing. Nothing. He's not talking about literal flesh and literal blood. He's talking about spiritual flesh and spiritual blood. The life transformation, life transforming power of Jesus living in our hearts. Jesus has to become a part of us. He has to be in us and through us completely is what Jesus is saying. It's the flesh doesn't profit anything. Notice verse 64, but there are, there are, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And verse 66 is a sobering verse. It says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him. How much? No more. So Jesus sees some of these guys walking away and he turns and he looks at the 12 as he gazes over the 12. Verse 67, then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Now Peter, I mean, he speaks before he thinks. This time he gets it right. Let's give him some credit. But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom? Shall we what? What does it say, friends? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do you believe that, friends? Jesus has the words of eternal life. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Also, we have come to believe. And notice what Peter says. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Where else can we go? I'm not going to turn back now, Peter says. I'm all in. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Friends, we must understand that we're in a war. We're caught in the middle of a great controversy between Christ and Satan. If life's not easy, it's because war is not easy. It's going to get harder, but press on, friends. Press on. Hang on to the plow. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Walk forward in faith. Cling to him like never before. There are people that want to know about Jesus right here in the town of Florence, in the town of Killen and Sheffield and Tuscumbia and Muscle Shoals and beyond. Do you believe that, friends? Are you going to be a soldier for him? Are you going to press on? We are soldiers for the king, sent to win souls for him. Do you love and trust him enough to hang on? Let me read you the promise the apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Maybe you have this one memorized. The apostle writes, he says, What then shall we say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? Though the devil raises up the gates of hell, Christ is so much more powerful. He can't stand against him. We can't stand against the devil, but the devil can't stand against Christ. Our prince, our king, our lord, our savior, is for us. Who can be against us? 
I want to make appeal, an appeal to you. My appeal is simple. And it's not for everybody today. Maybe there's a response for you today that you need to do. And, and if the Lord has convicted your heart, you respond right where you are. But my specific appeal today is this. Maybe someone in here today has, knowed, has known that they are drifting away. Maybe somebody in here is saying, I want to recommit my life to Jesus. Maybe someone, and we don't even know, has been contemplating, saying I, whether or not they're even going to stay in this, in this faith, whether they're going to hang on. And the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart that it's worth hanging on to Jesus. I mean, oh, friends, to spend time, to spend eternity with Jesus, I mean, heaven is going to be so unbelievable, but that's not what makes heaven heaven. Jesus is what makes heaven heaven. The other things are just a bonus. Oh, I pray that he's our best friend. If there's someone that wants to recommit their life to him, I, I'm going I'm to ask you to be a little bold today. I just want to have a special prayer for you. I want to invite you to come to the front, and I want to say a prayer of recommitment for you. A prayer of recommitment for you. Someone want to pray that prayer today? They're just convicted in their heart that they need to commit to hang on to the plow. It's okay if maybe it doesn't apply to you, and that's okay. Those of you online, this, this appeal is for you. The Lord knows your heart. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to have you here. After. Let's pray together, friends. Father in heaven, We're caught in the midst of a battle, Lord. I want to pray that we would be 100% fully committed, Lord. I pray that you would bless Dr. Arthur, Lord, and his commitment to you. And each one of us, Lord, in our commitment to you. May we hang on to the plow until the day that you come again. Lord, may we win souls for your kingdom is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing song today is Onward, Christian Soldiers. I invite you to stand with us as we sing our closing song. Onward, Christian Soldiers. <laughs>